In the world of science fiction, apocalypses, nuclear wars, and robot threats are nothing new, nor were they in 1984 when The Terminator came out. But under James Cameron's watch, it felt more visceral and real than ever. Yes, the fate of the world is at stake, but the battle is intimately focused on just two people, Sarah Connor and Kyle Reese. And James Cameron knew how important it was for us to connect with them. In a 1984 Starlog interview, he said this, More work was spent from a writing and acting standpoint trying to make the people believable in an everyday setting, both in the future and the present. These are people who get up, eat their Wheaties, complain about how much money they're not getting at work, then something incredible happens. The future comes down on them like a bag of bricks. When that bag of bricks comes down, we feel it because a good portion of the movie's runtime is spent with Sarah Connor just living life. By the time she's getting chased by a stop-motion endoskeleton, she's real enough that whether or not we fully buy the special effects, we definitely buy the danger and hope for her survival. Maybe more important than all that is the anticipation leading to the final battle. In addition to acquainting us with Sarah, the Terminator also spends much of the first half establishing a frightening threat while counting down to its inevitable arrival. It's 42 minutes into the movie when Kyle gives that famous monologue. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. But even before the speech, we've already seen glimpses of what the machine is capable of how no man or weapon can stop it, how it just takes whatever it wants, moving forward without slowing, ever. And while the Terminator mows people down, Sarah deals with an annoying job and an unreliable date. Nothing to indicate she'll be prepared for war with an unstoppable killing machine. But we know that war is coming, and have a pretty good idea when. The cyborg goes down the list of Sarah Connors, like a macabre countdown to her death. There are no jump scares in this movie, no. We know exactly where the Terminator is. Like the shark in Jaws or the shape in Halloween, we feel every painful second as it circles its prey. Thankfully, she has a protector, Kyle Reese. But even Kyle, in comparison to the T-800, gives us little confidence. The cyborg appears in the present, confidently marching forward without hesitation. Meanwhile, Kyle appears and from his first moments exudes desperation, out of breath, in pain, and cold. While the Terminator moves unimpeded, Kyle is already running from cops, fighting to even take one step toward the woman he's meant to protect. Everything in the first hour of this movie tells us about how dangerous the Terminator is and how unprepared our heroes are to face it. That desperation, partly borrowed from the slasher genre, bleeds through every frame, giving this movie an intimacy and grittiness lacking in most of the sequels. Oh, and the action is great too. All of that adds up to a pretty special movie. But in that same Starlog interview, Cameron said that while his job is first and foremost to entertain, his movies also need to say something. And like most great science fiction, The Terminator definitely has something to say. By the way, in this video, I'm only looking at the themes of The Terminator, the first in the series. This movie and the sequel definitely touch on many of the same themes, and in many ways Terminator 2 expands on them, but they were written years apart, so in terms of their deeper meaning, I take them as two separate explorations of their underlying ideas. Don't worry though, Terminator 2 is definitely on my list to cover, so at some point the double feature will likely be completed. For now, let's dive into the Terminator. It starts with fragility. The opening text of the movie tells us not that nuclear war is coming, but that it already happened. A couple of years earlier, Ridley Scott released Blade Runner and set it 37 years in the future because he wanted that future to feel imminent. 
something that could actually happen soon and serve as a warning for how things might easily go astray. James Cameron similarly set the Terminator's nightmare future only 45 years after the present. And that future is one where the world is already war-torn. The actual nuclear fire, which created the dark future, rages even earlier than that. Judgment Day, August 29, 1997, only 13 years after the movie's present. But Cameron takes it one step further. Thanks to time travel, that nightmare future is here tonight. We learn that in the blink of an eye, everything will disappear in Skynet's global takeover, and humanity will be pushed to the brink of extinction. And putting aside the big, conceptual idea of loss that's hard to wrap your head around, we feel the more personal loss for Sarah. Her friend is killed, her parents are killed, she falls in love only for the man she loves to be killed, and whatever desires or goals she had before are now replaced with one, ensure John Connor becomes humanity's savior. The message, life and whatever status quo we enjoy, is fragile, not just to threats we can predict like natural disasters or attacks from rival nations, but also unknown threats, things that we don't see coming at all. Those are the worst ones, the ones we're unprepared for, which suddenly prove our safety and comfort were an illusion the whole time, with an invisible ticking time bomb. This becomes scathingly apparent when the cops pick up Kyle Reese and Sarah Connor. In their custody, Kyle tells them everything about humanity's fall to Skynet and the Terminator sent to kill Sarah, but his warnings fall on deaf ears. He's laughed at, and by Dr. Silberman, he's seen as something to be exploited for personal gain. This is great stuff. I could make a career out of this guy. You can't exactly blame them, but seeing these authority figures meant to protect us completely fail to see the threat knocking on their door and hardly even slow the Terminator down when it comes for Sarah, it's hard not to see it. The cops were prepared for only one set of threats, thieves, murderers, and other everyday criminals. But once the unexpected and unknown arrives, they are powerless. Speaking to BAFTA guru, James Cameron mentioned that he was affected growing up during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and wrote those feelings of paranoia and fragility into this script. In fact, the Terminator threat in this movie is said to have grown from the same efforts as nuclear weapons, an attempt to strengthen our defense networks. But, and you all know the story by now, the AI we charged with protecting us decided that all humanity was a threat and in a microsecond, began global extermination. It goes without saying that the primary threat of concern in this movie is technology, especially when it comes to weapons. The nuclear stockpile on our planet is large enough to bring Earth to its knees, and the idea that AI could fire them all, or manipulate us into doing so by violating the mutual assured destruction between nations, is a frightening idea. But the job of great art is to give these ideas shape, so we don't just understand them, but feel them too. Terminator 2 Judgment Day does a great job of this by repeatedly showing Sarah's nightmare of nuclear blast. Again, the concept of loss is made real when we see families melting and our protagonist burnt to a crisp. But we're not there yet. For now, the Terminator uses images out of horror to instill a fear of artificial intelligence. A digital array of numbers and code won't do much to move the needle, but a metal corpse limping out of flames like one of George Romero's zombies, if they weren't so easy to kill, that's frightening. And after Kyle blows it up, only for the machine to crawl towards Sarah, wires dragging like entrails, suddenly, an AI joins the ranks of horror icons like Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger. There are also the nightmarish scenes of Los Angeles 2029 with piles of human skulls. Cameron also draws on images of real-world horrors. When Kyle describes humans being rounded up in camps for orderly disposal and shows the barcode tattooed on his arm, it's impossible not to think of the Holocaust concentration camps, and the tattoos used to identify prisoners. Clearly, these images were powerful, because about 40 years after the movies come out, 
Every advancement with AI is met with sneers, memes, and comparisons to Skynet. Probably a nuisance to scientists around the world, but also a check. Some friction to hopefully stop us from taking things too far. Aside from the obvious, there are other instances of paranoia around technology in the movie. Like the fact that virtually every time Sarah Connor uses a phone, it gets her in trouble. She leaves a message for her roommate that she's at Tech Noir, giving her location away to the Terminator. This touches on an idea that's only become more relevant today, data privacy. But it was already an issue back then, with concerns of wiretapping and phone call privacy. Later, Sarah calls her mother and lets her know where she's staying. But it's not her mother she's speaking with. It's the Terminator, mimicking her mother's voice after presumably killing her off screen. Once again, Sarah has given away her location, and once again, James Cameron has hit on a concern that's only become more relevant in the decades since. With the advent of deepfakes, which are less discernible from the real thing every day, it'll soon be impossible to know what's real and what's not. The next time you have a phone call or FaceTime with your mother, you might have no idea you're actually talking to Skynet. On that topic, James Cameron said this in an interview with BBC last year. If Skynet wanted to take over and wipe us out, it would actually look a lot like what's going on right now. It's not going to have to, like, wipe out the entire, you know, biosphere and environment with nuclear weapons to do it. It's going to be so much easier and less energy required to just turn our minds against ourselves. All Skynet would have to do is just deep fake a bunch of people, pit them against each other, stir up a lot of foment, and just run this giant deep fake on humanity. One thing which is sort of glossed over in the movie is why Skynet decided to destroy us. We get just one line of dialogue from Kyle. Defense network computers. New, powerful, hooked into everything, trusted to run it all. They say it got smart, a new order of intelligence. Then it saw all people as a threat, not just the ones on the other side. It decided our fate in a microsecond. He almost makes it sound like a glitch. We defined the bad guy, but the computer got all screwy and ended up putting everyone in the bad guy category. Maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe there's a logic to it and some sort of condemnation of humanity where Skynet's decided we don't deserve to live. Or maybe it's self-preservation, where Skynet's determined that if we realize it's self-aware, we'll try to shut it down. So it struck first. But none of that is in this film. In fact, it's one area James Cameron would like to expand on if he were to be involved in another Terminator movie. On the Smartless podcast with Jason Bateman, Will Arnett, and Sean Hayes, just a few weeks ago, he said this. If I were to do another Terminator film and, and maybe try to, try to launch that franchise again, which is in discussion, but no, nothing's been decided, um, I would make it much more about, about the AI side of it than, than kind of Bad robots gone, gone yeah. crazy. Please. Sort of admitting that this movie glosses over the why and focuses much more on just the threat AI would pose, if it were to go bad. In that same podcast, clarifying why AI worries him, he said... And, you know, the point is that no technology has ever not been weaponized. Yeah. Yeah. And do we really want to be fighting something smarter than us that isn't us on our yeah. own world? I don't think so. This is the part of the equation that the Terminator focuses on. Just how scary it would be if AI turned on us. We get hints at how quickly and callously it can make grave decisions, settling on genocide of the human race in a microsecond. We see glimpses of a dark, hellish future. And we see how powerful just one Terminator can be. Kyle and Sarah spend most of the movie running because they know they don't stand a chance against the Terminator. I mentioned vulnerability earlier in the context of just how easily our existence can be appended. But there's another sort of vulnerability at play too, flesh and blood. Kyle is shot once and he bleeds. A second bullet nearly kills him and finally, getting a little too close to the explosion which rips the Terminator in half, finally does him in. 
Meanwhile, a single piece of shrapnel in her leg is excruciating for Sarah and slows her to a crawl. Meanwhile, the Terminator takes many bullets, a couple knives, and a couple explosions. And at worst, they slow him down a little. They are hopelessly outmatched against one Terminator who manages to kill close to 30 people in the movie. Imagine an army of Terminators led by a global AI capable of impossibly quick thinking and strategizing. With only quick glimpses of the future, it's mostly left to the imagination, but this movie provides all the nightmare fuel necessary to make AI scary. It also touches on a more imminent and literal threat, nuclear proliferation. The topic is more directly addressed in sequels, but it's at least mentioned in this movie. The opening text alludes to nuclear fire, and Kyle mentions nuclear war, so we at least get the idea that nuclear weapons played a role in Skynet's apocalypse. Plenty of movies have addressed the horrors that may come from nuclear war. As I mentioned before, we now have weapons capable of destroying the world. But as a threat, that's something difficult for us to wrap our heads around, because it still lives in an us-versus-them mentality. As long as they don't fire, neither will we. So we all have an escape hatch to absolve ourselves in the threat of nuclear war. In The Terminator, James Cameron extrapolates that threat to a point where it becomes a common enemy. Skynet was created by the United States as the next stage in nuclear defense, but it got a mind of its own. Now the threat is no longer nebulous or conceptual, instead it's taken shape as a metallic creature straight out of a nightmare. Which is literally true. James Cameron was inspired to write the movie based on a nightmare he had of a chrome skeleton emerging from fire. If just talking about nuclear war in concept doesn't scare us into action, maybe turning it into a monster, something to haunt our dreams, can do it. In this sense, the movie is less about why the AI turned on us, because the AI instead acts as a metaphor, representing the inherent danger of the powerful weapons we've created. Ultimately, Staying only within the context of The Terminator, again the sequels are for another day, humanity triumphs. When in police custody, Kyle Reese explains how in the future, John Connor has led them to the Skynet defense grid and destroyed it. They won! Sending the Terminator back in time was Skynet's Hail Mary pass, and after John sent Kyle through, the time displacement equipment was destroyed, meaning no one else is going back in time. This battle between Kyle, Sarah, and the T-800 truly is the last battle for humanity. By destroying the Terminator, Sarah Connor lives and John will be born to lead humanity's victory. So in the end, what saved us? Mostly the usual action hero stuff. Kyle and Sarah's resilience in a desperate situation, their ability to be resourceful and think on their feet, their bravery, etc. But also, Love. The only reason Kyle volunteered to take a one-way trip to 1984 is because John, long ago, gave him a small photo of his mother, Sarah. And throughout the years, her picture was a small beacon in the hell around him. From only that photo, he fell in love. So when John asked for volunteers, of course Kyle stepped up. In their brief time together, Sarah loved him back. And months after Kyle's death, had their son, John Connor. Kyle was able to withstand the pain of time travel and sacrifice himself in a desperate fight thanks in large part to one of the greatest motivators of all, love. But it's also worth noting that all of this hinges on the idea that our survival depends on one man. Given the end of time's imagery, John Connor almost comes across as a messianic figure. And I could point out that he has the same initials as a certain other messianic figure, and I could point out that while John's birth wasn't immaculate, it was certainly under some very odd and impossible circumstances. But the idea of a savior is not unique to Christianity or even religion. It's also an idea steeped in American culture, especially action movies, where saving the day often comes down to the talents and skills of one person. Though, in some sense, 
Sarah is the true savior, as she's the one who taught John how to fight, strategize, and organize, though that's only because John sent Kyle back in time to set her on that path. Then again, John only exists thanks to her. Who knows, to quote Sarah, God, a person could go crazy thinking about this. Anyway, it's important to note that John is not a typical action hero, single-handedly taking down the enemy. Instead, he's a leader. His talent is not that he can destroy the enemy, but that he can teach humanity to join forces and become a more powerful resistance, one with enough force to collectively destroy the enemy. So in the face of an apocalyptic threat, what will save us according to James Cameron? Love, which motivates us to fight, and leadership, which teaches us how. Banding together, people can do a lot, but ultimately, someone has to take charge and set the path, especially when the thing we're hoping to accomplish is something that's never been done before. Killing a Terminator is impossible, until you see someone else do it. That's what John did for the Resistance, and how he became their leader. In any movie involving time travel, it's likely that the question of free will versus fate will come up, especially when you face bootstrap paradoxes, like John sending Kyle back in time to become his own father. So how did John even exist to begin with? Things get even crazier in Terminator 2 when you find out that the events of the first Terminator are the reasons why Skynet exists to begin with. And by the way, if you just want an analysis of all the time travel in these movies, check out my Terminator Timeline Explained video, which covers everything from the original through Dark Fate. On the question of free will, we don't see anything in this movie which definitively answers the question, because ultimately, everything that occurs seems predetermined. For example, in the dark future Kyle came from, he holds on to that photo of Sarah Connor, and the movie ends with Sarah getting that very picture taken. Put another way, Kyle comes from the future, and everything which occurs in this movie leads right back to that exact same future. Sarah's photo, John's birth, etc. If that's true, there should have been nothing to worry about, right? Sarah and Kyle could have just kicked back, self-assured in their victory. But clearly, that's not what we see. Both characters are pushed to their limit in the fight against the Terminator. They don't get a second to rest, and even when they're hurt or in pain, they have to keep moving and keep fighting. And maybe the biggest insult of all? Victory doesn't look much like victory. Kyle ends up dead, and Sarah faces a long and lonely road to the apocalypse. He said there's a storm coming in. I know. Going back to Cameron's original point on humanity's fragility, our victory and our survival is never assured. And even when winning means barely winning, we still have to keep fighting, even if that means sacrificing everything and in the end still having to withstand the coming storm. We can't ever let up. Otherwise, Skynet wins. Kyle says it all in the message John had him memorize for Sarah, something John originally heard from her which she heard from Kyle, which he heard from John, which he heard from Sarah. Okay, sorry. Go watch my other video if you want to untangle that mess. Anyway, yeah, Kyle's message. Thank you, Sarah, for your courage through the dark years. I can't help you with what you must soon face except to say that the future is not set. You must be stronger than you imagine you can be. You must survive or I will never exist. Funny enough, the line which becomes so crucial in Terminator 2 was actually removed from this scene, so we never hear Kyle say, there's no fate but what we make for ourselves. While everything we see leads to a seemingly preset future, this message tells us that it's not guaranteed. It does require strength in the darkness and a fight for survival. The movie is dark in its warning about nuclear weapons, AI, and technology in general, but it is ultimately hopeful in humankind's ability to overcome even the most insurmountable odds. As to the actual physics of it, whether free will exists or it's all predetermined, that question gets more directly addressed in Terminator 2. But in this movie, it's worth pointing out that the characters knew they were fighting for a predetermined future. Kyle was not trying to change the past. 
humanity already won in the future, and it was the machines who were trying to alter the timeline. So humanity's victory in this film always meant leaving the question of determinism ambiguous, because winning meant keeping the timeline intact. The timeline where, yes, nuclear fire engulfs the world and Terminators step out of the flames, but ultimately, John Connor leads our last survivors to victory. The future is not changed because Sarah and Kyle explicitly did not try to change it. That won't happen until Terminator 2, which is a question for another day. There's a lot that made the Terminator special. James Cameron and Gail Ann Hurd knew how to write suspense, balancing screen time between setup and execution, making the characters feel real, and as a result, the danger too. Cameron knew how to direct action. Arnold Schwarzenegger was perfect as a killing machine. The blend of science fiction and horror was certainly seen before, but not often. And finally, it doesn't just entertain, but also explores some themes. The survival of the human race, the dangers of AI, and exercising free will in the face of a dark future. Or a dark fate, if you will. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments what other movies or shows you'd like me to cover in this series. Like I said, there's a good chance I'll tackle Terminator 2 soon. It feels silly to talk about one and not the other, though I can't promise I'll go much further than that in the Terminator series. Though who knows, maybe the upcoming anime series will be worth a look. Fingers crossed. With that, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more. Thank you for watching, and see you on the next One Take.